Well, welcome, Gary Gary Beers. <laughs> is it Gary Gary Beers? It is. Yep. It's it's funny. It's it's what um, I think it was Michael's girlfriend years and years ago when we first started out started calling me Gary Gary, and then my then girlfriend, who was her best friend, she did the artwork, like the actual writing, hand write, handwritten lyrics and credits on the first two albums. Okay. And she wrote Gary Gary, and she spelled it two R's one R, which just stuck. So. <laughs> I'll thank her for that. But but um, given name is Gary with two R's. Yep. Right. Yep. Cool. Um, and so what what drew you to to the base? Um, I lost a bet. I lost a bet with my two best friends in school. Um, I, I was playing really bad acoustic guitar, getting lessons from a really grumpy old man who kept asking me if I really wanted to play guitar. And then my two best mates play guitar, and we're like, let's form a band. And whoever's Whoever's the worst has to buy a bass, and that was me. I lost, I lost the bet, and bought, you know, went out and got a bass, and became the only other bass player in the area besides um, one other guy who played like Chris Squire, Rickenbacker stuff. Right. So I became. Yeah. It may, it may have seemed like you lost a bet, but I think in the long term you won, really. Yeah, I think so. I think pretty much so. I'm still in touch with the, those guys, and yeah, they that's how they they look at it too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, so how long after? We kind of picking up the bass. Did the NXS thing happen? Um, I used to. I went to school with Tim, the eldest Far Farris brother. There's obviously three brothers in the band, um, but he and I weren't exactly mates because he was, you know, he had a girlfriend, and I, I was the eternal virgin, and I was a surfing guy, and I, you know, took up music as a hobby. But he was a pretty serious musician. And is this up in Manly? This is in Prince's Forest, which is in the hills above Manly. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, and I went to, we went to Forest High School, but he's he had two brothers that went to a school up the road at Davidson High, and I met Andrew by accident at a at a surf club dance. Um, we got there early. A mate of, of mine, we, you know, we drove down there early to see to watch help a band set up. You know, some other friends of ours that were playing, and there's in the dark. You know, they hadn't found the power switch yet, and there was a guy that I thought was Tim in the back of the room, and it was actually Andrew. So I went and introduced myself thinking it was Tim, but it was Andrew. And he goes, yeah, I've heard about you. You're Gary and you've got a bass. <laughs> and the next day I was jamming with Andrew and John. And then Andrew and I formed our first band together. Wow. Yeah. And that would, what you, how long ago would that be? That was 70, gosh, 70, I was still at school, 74. <laughs> a while ago. Coming up, coming on 50 years next year. Oh yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Yep. Um, and like, I guess looking back, how, what does, what do you think NXS means to you now versus when you were in the midst of it or, you know, how, how's your perspective on that whole thing shifted? It, it changes to be honest. Like having just got back from my first trip to Australia in, in, in pretty much, I've been there once in 11 years. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, I, and that was just for two nights, and I, so I didn't get to see my family and my sister, or I was, and I didn't really have any quality time with the guys because I was just there to do some award stuff and then fly out next, you know, a couple of days later. So yeah, yeah. This this recent time, I I um I spent I think nine or ten days. I stayed at my sister's house and I got to hang out with Kirk and Tim on the North Shore and and hang out with the band in the functions. Um, and I have. It's just funny because, like, I, I've you know, obviously losing Michael was was a horrendous thing to go through because he wasn't just our singer; he was you know my mate from from school. So, um, I think this time I was more open to letting the memories flood back. So I was mm -hmm. actually hired a car and I was driving around seeing the various houses that I lived in, you know, with Andrew and with you know and Michael and where I grew up, you know, as a as a kid. That's the house is still there. Um, our old school. Is still there. I mean, it's just it was just interesting going back and being more open minded to it, or open to letting the feelings flood in. Mm. Whereas in the past, I haven't been. I just I really I live in America. I'm I'm pretty busy here with my my family here, and you know projects here, and I just haven't really um, let the whole history and memories of of any excess um, come back. But this time I have because. Um, it, it's pretty good memories, and I, and my memories of it are, are pretty pretty fond. I mean, pretty good. But yeah, I 
we we together we achieved an amazing success you know, like from a bunch of kids from the north shore in australia in sydney to you know selling out wembley stadium selling out you know madison square garden playing japan you know like just headlining all the big festivals throughout europe we just really conquered the world and i i'm i look at it now with a a renewed sense of pride in what we did and and the music the music's timeless so that's you know when i'm we're all when we're all dust and gone the music will still be kicking on so that's that's the really good thing yeah i mean you you guys were huge in the uk like num- number ones heaps right you know it, it's funny uk was what was it took a long time because uk hates australians you know like it was probably pretty mutual in, it was english always... well you've up, up north of the border you'd be I, fine i know i'm not i'm not saying scottish <laughs> that's why i knew you were from glasgow because i can you know, i've been to glasgow many times and i can tell the no, difference but there, but... There, there is definitely a you know a bit of a rivalry there well yeah and and you know i think english will always have a be pissed off that we're the convicts that they sent to club med you know like um <laughs> you know and we you know we all live, live on the beach and we're all good at sport and you know like it's we our, our our initial ancestors suffered of course being if they were convicts or initial early settlers but right now it's you know it's a pretty nice place to live so we always rub that into the english when we go back but <laughs> i think generally it was always you know, more the sports thing more the you know we really don't like each other because of sport yep and england really didn't accept australian bands they just always thought it was us bring you know bringing stuff back to you know bringing english music back to england but we we were more American. I mean, we we really grew up on the American funk, and, yeah. and played you know our version of kind of a American funk with with a fair bit of punk attitude um, that we got from the Australian pubs. So we took something different back to England. It took a while. I mean, it, our first hit was a re-release of, of "Need You Tonight." Like it was, it flopped the first time it was released, but we did a remix and re-released it, and it was a hit. So. Um, yeah, you know, and and we'd go and we'd play, we'd sell out Royal Albert Hall, and the reviews are like, oh, it's full of Australians. You know, like it just, it just, we just didn't get the respect that, yeah, you know, and that's fine. It just made us work harder to to earn it. So, um, you know, England, England was one of the last to fall for us. Yeah, right. And did you did you spend did you do gigs and I'm sure you must have played Glasgow, Edinburgh. All yeah, we all the time we did. We actually. We would do the to do things differently. We toured in winter, which was pretty, pretty um, um, you know, life threatening. Driving around <laughs> England and Europe in the in and and um, yeah. Scotland was that, was in, that in, so? In was that so? You did America during summer? Yeah, we did America in summer and winter, but but mm. we just we just did a, a tour of of. We, we always found that if we went there when other bands weren't there, and that and we took the time to go there and meet fans that the fans would remember us and appreciate it more. Hmm. And we found that out. We did a tour. I'm pretty sure we had, um, Sinead O'Connor was, was our support act in that tour. And it ended up being the most successful tour of the winter in England because no one else was doing it. So, um, and it was, it was, it was tough work, but it was really good to get out and meet people and, and help cement our little, you know, each step at a time going up, um, in in the UK and and also through Europe, so um, yeah, and same with America. We just kept coming back. I mean, we we played all the college circuit. We, you know, we really started breaking on college radio in America first, um, and we just found that the, the hub. You know, same as Australia, we just found that the, the more you get out there and get in people's faces, the more they're going to um, understand and mm. and come off the ride. Was was there a moment that you can remember where you felt like that we've we've turned a corner like we're kind of we've made it <laughs> or was it kind of gradual that you didn't re it just kind of just kept on building it just kept building in different like countries at different times i mean original sin was a number one hit in france like 18 months after it was released it just took that long to become a hit mm. um you know our album the swing became a huge hit in Australia, um, but it would, did nothing in anywhere else in the world. And then, listen, like thieves, and what you need cracked America. And then, and then it, it's, and that was the beginning of us getting a, a foothold in the UK. 
um, with that album. And then it all kind of came together with Kick around the world. So, but each each territory, um, each you know continent just took a different time period. So we're always working at it. And so you know the feeling of of success was different in each territory. Mm. You know, Australia, you know, playing for, you know, Prince Charles and Lady Diana on their honeymoon tour was a big thing. You know, you realise you, you kind of made it there. Um, but, yeah, just various things around the world. You know, headlining Texas Stadium, supported by Guns N' Roses and Iggy Pop. That's a pretty big moment, you know. Um, <laughs> in America with, with Ziggy Marley and the Whalers. You know, like, you know, getting to hang out and meet the, the, the real Whalers, you know, like supporting mm-hmm. Ziggy Marley. Playing with Ziggy Marley and that, you know, like just things where you realize this is this is where you want to be, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you must have you must have met some interesting characters along the way, oh, he, yeah. you know, heroes that you've maybe or you know people you've looked up to, and then you rubbing shoulders with them at some some gig or tour. Yeah, we and it was just interesting because we had I know we had um, we we're in Adelaide playing a big outdoor show of, of our own, and then. Was sitting uh, having the the meal with the crew, and then walks Mick Jagger by himself, no entourage, no security, just by himself. Sits down, eats eats up with us and the crew, and he came. He was about to do a, a solo tour of, of of Australia, his first solo tour besides the Stones, and he, he came. And he was sitting with our lighting guy, taking notes of our, at our show, <laughs> and we thought that was pretty amazing and then we got to hang out with him and when he came back to tour proper we you know we hang out a lot and he you know we'd go and see his shows and he'd come to ours and it was just um and then you know madison square garden you walk off stage and there's keith richard sitting on a road case with a bottle of vodka in his hand and his wife on the other hand and hey mates you know and it was just um all that all, you know there was a lot of that going on i mean just where it, you'd get to meet your heroes and play mm-hmm. and play in venues that you grew up watching on black and white TV back in Australia when you were a kid, you know, like Royal Albert Hall where Deep Purple, you know, played with the orchestra. It's like, you know, just, just, you know, and, and you know, obviously I saw Queen when I was in high school and to get to play with Queen at, at Wembley and then to go on tour around Europe with Queen and be as their special guest was, you know, not many young blokes from, from you know, the North Shore of Sydney get to do that, you know. Yeah. Yeah, not not many people in the world get to do that <laughs> yeah um it's interesting like you, you were saying uh in excess were kind of like a american funk band but with aussie pub rock punk attitude what yeah what was your and you know one thing i've noticed from from playing a couple of in excess tunes in my time um is you, I find that your approach to to bass playing a lot of time is kind of minimal. Would mm-hmm. that be fair? Like not all the time, yeah. obviously, but you know. Oh, no, that's very fair. I mean, I'm, I'm in a band with two, sometimes three guitar players. I mean, I can't, I can't go nuts. I got to hold it down and and be solid. And I really enjoy being solid. I really enjoy, you know, I, I very rarely venture up up the fretboard because I, I've just got to keep it solid and tight with with John the drummer and. He and I, you know, our showing off was actually as a rhythm section. Hmm. Other other rhythm sections would go, wow, that's a. They'd hear what we're doing and and be impressed because we we had this kind of psychic connection, you know, like. Um, but as far as showing off, being a, a virtuoso was not really what I was there for. I was there to to just to be the bread and butter, um, sort of member of the band and you know hold it together, keep it tight. Um, remind everyone where they are in the song when they're all, you know, getting lost in with lyrics and and places in in the arrangement. I'd always be the ones that they look to. You know, that was my job. Classic bass player. Yep, classic bass player. Holding, holding things together. No, but I think yep. that, that you know that's true. I think having that um, that mentality of obviously like playing for the song and trying to make trying to make everybody else not make everybody else sound good, but you know. Um, Kind of just supporting, you know, being at the back, pushing things along. Um, yeah, as we a always player, said you that be, you have to be cool with that. Well, exactly. And we always said that, you know, John and Andrew, and myself at the back with the engine room, and and Michael and Tim, the two guitar players, and Michael at the front with a with a pointy end. You know, like and um, you know, it, sometimes you think, gee, I like to be down the front more often, but then 
I can't hear myself properly. I'd like, rather be standing in front of my in, enormously loud bass rig, you know, having my pants blown around. So, you know, I, that's that's what I, that's where I, I prefer to be. You know, like I'm more yeah. comfortable. So, um, and it's a pretty amazing place to be sitting there with a. Do you, you know, find that um, you know, having that more kind of raw approach, you you were a bit more um, mindful of like the tone that you were using like did you like what i guess what i'm what i'm trying to ask is what how what was your um perspective on a tone that would work in in those those settings you know it's it, it, it all came down to me I, I mean i went through a lot of you know different variations of, of bases I, I i worked with ibanez i worked with pv i i as soon as i got my first p bass an, an old l series p bass but before that i was I was buying cheap copies and and learning what I know now about bass making I, by pulling them apart, putting in different pickups, you know, just just butchering them basically, um, ripping frets out to make them fretlesses and then putting them back in again and then you know like all that sort of stuff. That's what that's how I was I was getting my different sounds, but then I realized when I, once I got a P bass that the variations I wanted to get were either going to come from just how I played, like mm. pick fingers. Sometimes a bit of slap, not much. I'm not very good at it, um, and just and some effects, just you know, just to get a, a different sound. But the bottom, the bottom line for me was it. it I just had to keep it solid, and you know, because we also had keyboard bass in the band. So Andrew would, would you know, we on the records we'd we work together to get a keyboard bass and and basses working together, um, mm. and then so that was always I had to be mindful of that life too, that to keep to not you know, go crazy, you know, and lose the plot as far as, you know, this <clears throat> paper and everything that needed to be, you know, put back together on stage that came from the record. So, you yeah. know, we, yeah. You know, um, and we also had, you know, John, you know, amazing drummer and, and he had some loops and stuff going on. Um, so there's a lot going on that I had to play with and around. Mm. Yeah. Is the whole kind of like synth bass with real bass thing, I guess that was, that was also pretty evident in like late seventies, early eighties funk stuff as well. Yeah, we're very much into funkadelic and and um, early Nile Rodgers albums where he had keyboard yeah. bass as well. And or even like you know Mike, Michael Jackson, all the Quincy Jones stuff. Yeah, bit of that yeah. in there. Yeah, but even before that, I mean, you got Stevie Wonder. I mean, you know, the, probably the first guy to play synth bass. You know, like you think yeah, about that. Of course, yeah. Um, and and even even Zeppelin. I mean, John Paul Jones was playing. Yeah, left hand bass when he was playing the organ. So um there's a you know, since I've been loving you, I could never work out how he got infinite sustain until I realized he's he's it's he's playing a keyboard. Yeah, yeah. Um so you know it's it's stuff you learn. And then and you know speaking of John Paul Jones, that's where really where I got the need to play pick, fingers, keyboard, whatever, you know, we always had a, a phrase in excess is whatever's clever. And that's yeah, you know, whatever whatever worked within the framework of the song and the band and and the members of the band, that's what we did. Well, it seemed to work. <laughs> it did. I mean, there's there's songs where it didn't work. I mean, there's and there's you know, there's there's songs that also worked in the record but didn't work live. Where mm. we you know, there's probably songs that we didn't tour. Um, you know, there's there's I don't know, and there's songs that that really sound good on record, but uh, the crowd, yeah, you know, they just want to dance. <laughs> yeah, most yeah. people that come and come and see us just want to want to move, you know. So, yeah. um, we throw in some, you know, some thinkers, but you know, usually the you know the never terraces apart, you know, the ones where they can, you know, creates an emotion as opposed to just a, you know, do you look at us? Aren't we amazing? We don't, we, you know, we we're not really good at that, you know. We're just more <laughs> creating emotions and 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 moods, you know. Yeah. And what about? Uh like rigs did you go down rabbit holes of preamps and power amps and yeah i i everything as i said i, I worked with pv i had pv gear for quite a while i i still use pv um as you can see i still use the old black widows yeah um still got the old 80s black widows um and yeah ampere gear i i i ended up really just settling on ampeg svts and and 
and and PV Black Widow speakers. That was that was my favorite rig for you know, for quite a while. Are those um, um 15s? Yeah, they're 15s. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty much all. I, I I've yeah. You know, I try t- 10s and I try 12s, and I always come back to 15s. I just like a huge round sound. I mean, and I had yeah. You know, on stage, I had two SVT heads and you know two cabs, and I designed a cabinet for Ampeg that I use, um, which was called a fifteen forty, which is a you know it's an eight ten cabinet but with a fifteen in the bottom and four tens in the top in one cabinet. So weighed a ton, but it just got the, the right amount of bottom end, you know, you know, big round bottom end and and the top end as well. So, but I just tend to stick with fifteens and um, lots of them. I mean, I just like a lot of volume. <laughs> Fair enough. I can't. And- I've gone off SVTs because I can't. I, you know, last time I got one, I I tried to lift it and did the back. So um, uh, <laughs> it's more of a weight thing now. So, but I'm in the process of. of I'm waiting to try out some stuff from a English company, Ash- Ashton. Oh yeah. They, um, I met yeah I met them at Nam again earlier this year, and um, yeah, they're sending me some gear to try out because uh, they got they make some nice stuff. Yeah, they do. I had I had one of the, they had like a thirty watt kind of tube base base head that I had for a little bit, and it sounded great. It wasn't quite enough for for gigging. Yeah, but, but sound wise, it was it was it was pretty good. Yeah, they got a two hundred watt tube head. I want to try it, um, but yeah, we'll just just to see how it goes. I'm not really. I mean, I, I want to go out and tour again next year, but at this at this point, I don't really need a rig. I sold. A lot of my gear just in a recently just to clear it out because I, you know, I don't need it. I can't lift half of it, so I got rid of most of it. So. <laughs> and what what about um like recording chains in the studio? Was it B fifteen or just kind of DI'd? What was your approach there? It was always a flip top. Yeah, as soon as I met Chris Thomas, because before that I was I was using my live rigs and um and often I I grab one of them. huh you were using a live rig in the studio yeah. Like usually my PVs or yeah, you know, like I had the big PV. I think there was something or other four hundred solid state, and they were pretty good to be honest. I don't know where they went. I, I had two of them. They're gone. I just re- realized a couple of months ago. I went, where did they go? Hmm. So they um they disappeared somewhere. But um, they're propping up the foundations the studio, of your house. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, but often in the studio, I I sometimes plug in through the you know the guitar players, hundred watt Marshalls or whatever, and but then um. Chris Thomas turned up for the for Listen Like Thieves. He goes, "You got a flip top, right?" And I'm like, "What's a what's a flip top?" So I, I, I next time I was in America, I bought three of them, and I've still got one here somewhere around the studio, and um, they're still the best recording amp. And you can't go wrong with a flip top, a P bass, and just a, a big you know a big meaty microphone shoved somewhere in the front of it. it doesn't yeah. really matter where you shove it; it's still going to sound good. Um, but yeah, that's 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 what I was using in the studio. Uh, as soon as I sort of discovered flip tops, that was it. And were you like, were you blending with a DI, or was it pretty much just the the cab? Uh, with a DI, yeah, as well, yeah. Okay. But it's funny because I, I I'd use effects, but I, I never really recorded with effects. It was uh, you know once I get in the studio, I was like just keep it simple and yeah. let the you know, and Kirk as you know on his guitar as time went on we get more and more into effects so he didn't want to really clash with whatever he had going on you know and yeah. and you know he just basically worked to fit in with the in the confines of what everyone else is doing you know and there's yeah, certain yeah. songs where it would start from the bass and everyone would work you know their way around that on the way up so you know we just whatever's clever yeah <laughs> i think um with effects a lot of time it works more live because it kind of you're looking for extra and or you're looking to compensate maybe for what's not on the recording like you know you're trying to create extra energy by kicking on that fuzz or the chorus to kind of you know for dramatic effect almost you know when you're on stage so that when you, especially when you're playing these bigger stages you kind of have to really labor the points sometimes yeah i think also you know as far as with any excess I, i'm I'm the one that, that ventures away from exactly what I played on the record more than anybody. I mean, I know Kirk likes to play it exactly to, to, to the note and the sound. And, uh, but me and Tim, you know, Tim, the you know, main guitar, you know, we, he was like the meat and potatoes guitar player mm-hmm. and he and I were on the same side. So we, 
we just lock into our own riffs, you know, and you know, he had the more aggressive sound, so I'd be getting the more aggressive sound behind him. Um, but you know, whatever the song dictated, I'd, I'd you know, I'd, I'd get the sound for it. Yeah. Well, you know, seeing as we're talking about bass sounds and stuff like, we should probably talk about these guys. Yep. These GGBs. Mm-hmm. Is, I guess is it technically GGBBs, Gary? Gary. <laughs> uh, no. Okay. <laughs> no, Gary Gary B is basis. GGB okay. basis. Um, so as far as I can understand, this kind of has been a long time coming, and it kind of started with this amazing pickup idea. Yeah, had. I, I had the concept for the pickup in the late nineties in Australia. Um, just just after the last tour with Michael, I just thought, well, it's about time I. I really got serious about about um, making the sound I've always heard in my head, and I did electronics for a couple of years after. You know, when I finished high school, I did a technical college. I was going to be, um, you know, doing electronics. I, that was the new thing was electronics, but I bombed out of that because I'm colorblind. Oh. Um, so my circuits, I couldn't work out when my circuits get blowing up, and then I realized I I, I was getting all the values wrong because I was colorblind. Cut the um, blue wire. <laughs> yeah, both no, it's more like yeah, the bands of of you know the little bands of color that tell you how what your resistor or your capacitor are. If you get it wrong, you're out by thousands. So you know, yeah. <laughs> so that was me. That was electronics. But I learned enough to to know about you know the basic basic things of, of what's in a guitar. And then <clears throat> uh, and I always be working on the band's guitars. Like Andrew would. Want a different pickup, so I'd swap. You know, I'd be doing that in the in the background, um, and I just finally decided to start working on the pickup design, and then um, kind of did some work, moved to America, sort of put that to the side. And then I was just at, at a swap meet, and there's a pickup winder, a winding machine. So I, I got that, and I went got my old paperwork out and taught myself how to wind a pickup, and just kept experimenting until I got you know, basically worked off my initial plans and then worked on getting exactly what I wanted with the directions of the wines and how many wines and did a lot of research on different, you know, vintage pickups. And then I applied for the patent and then took patent got me, it took me two years to get the patent, but I, I got the patent for a, the, the quad pickup. So, and then from four string through to 10 string, which I didn't ask for, but I, they gave it to me. So I built four and five string pickups, um, and they sound incredible. They just they just get, you know, the basic sound is your is your is your classic vintage sounding P bass, quite a you know fat big P bass sound. To, but it's I, I copied the amount of wines in my fifty eight DNXS bass, Old Faithful. So that's the basic sound is the is the P bass, and then you know easy to get the reverse P bass, the full humbucker, which is more of a music manny kind of sound, and then the the two split humbucker sounds, which are more of a vintage um single coil p bass sounds um and the yeah you know, it, it may seem like you know coming out of one pickup that you're not going to get too much variation but you really do i mean i've I really kind of worked it out that you can get a pretty good variation of sounds out of that one pickup and there's no batteries simple controls you know i i, I went down the whole path of trying it active i'm not a fan of active bases you know i just just they just to me more so when you're in the studio, you can't get the same sound twice to me. I mean, to, in my mind, uh, to my ears. So, yeah, I just, just kept working at it. And I finally um, and started working with a company called Mojo Tone in North Carolina. And they, you know, a guy called Dave Shepard helped me fine tune the pickup and okay. built them. So what what was it that you were... What was it you felt that was lacking, or what did you feel was missing from just you know the P base? Like, what what was the goal with it? Was it just to be more flexible, or was there a more of a specific sound that you were chasing? It's just more flexible, and I uh, I have played reverse reverse P base, you know, where the mm. split humbuckers back to front, and they look ugly. Uh, you know, it just doesn't <laughs> look right. But to my brain, it's more common sense to have that where the you know the, the treble sides in the fatter position 
Yeah. And the base dives more towards the bridge in a in a you know, it's not going to pick up more bottom end. So having that variation to me was was more common sense. And then the full humbucker, as luck would have it, I mean, I was going for more of a vintage Gibson, but it sounds quite music manny. Mm. As well as, you know, if you add a bit of grit to it, it's very vintage Gibson as well. Um, I've even got a pretty good, decent Rickenbacker sound out of these things. Mm. Um, but then it's, yeah, it's just a matter of I've always tried to keep stick to one bass live because within excess, it was always I would usually have to start the song or I would usually have to be ready to come in pretty early in the song. So I couldn't be changing, changing basses and, you know, um, you know, I just like to keep things simple um, and, and not have less things that could go wrong. I tried MIDI bases that worked quite well until it went spectacularly wrong at a huge outdoor festival. Oh, really? Yeah, it locked on the wrong note Was that for the, the whole time. Base? It locked locked on a semitone out of, of of a drone for Mediate, which was just like you could the the PA was just like with a semitone out at the bottom end and the and the and low end keyboards. It was horrible. You could just feel. The, the whole stage vibrating out of tune. And it was like, that's it. I never played a MIDI bass again. Um, wow. So I was just, that, was that the PV cyber bass? It was, it was Steve Chick. I used to work with Steve Chick who ended up getting the PV, working with PV to get the PV MIDI bass. But he and I, he had his first prototypes and he and um, myself and Steve Balby were his two go-to bass players to work with. So was that, and, did he become industrial radio? Was that, I don't know. I, I haven't spoken to Steve for quite a while, but he was he was side stage when I handed in the bass and went, thanks, but, you know. <laughs> um, but he had, he had it. It was an amazing thing. I mean, but also it took a lot of programming because I had, if you look at if you look at what you need at, in the Wembley concert, if you look at yeah. that, the footage, there's all this cool, um, you know, moaning, you know, girl moaning and, and sort of um, remix kind of stuff. That's all me. I actually got a cassette of of one of our remixes by I think by Cold Cut of of what you need and just put it in a sampler and I so I had a rack of samplers and then just painstakingly put it on each note on each different strings and had all the different sounds and on it and um yeah so all that middle section is me just wow. me and you know and and I didn't tell anybody and they're all going what the hell? and you can see Michael going on <laughs> what are you? Wait, you, just, you just said you like to keep things simple. This sounds like the most. I know, but it was a, it was a back. moment where I could. <laughs> it, it was just it would break down, and, and we just have a just drums, you know. And I thought, well, now's my moment. Trigger these you know, samples. Something else going on except drums and Michael doing the you know leading up to the, the whoa, whoa, whoa thing. So, uh, and as John's you know noticing, I'm doing it. He just extended the, the you know we extended it. So, you know, we like to keep things per. Not so much me, but you know, most of the band like to keep things as per the record. But there mm -hmm. were some songs where we could lash out, and that was one of them. Taste it was another, um, where you know it was more open to whatever happened on stage. Um, yeah, happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, how, how long ago has it been since you kind of finalised the pickup design to these bases actually coming to life? I got the pattern in 2017 and then I was working, you know, I started, I built um, probably 12 prototypes um, myself and picked out the colors and the shapes and, and then COVID hit. Mm -hmm. And um, I was working with Mojo Tone, as I mentioned in North Carolina and they lost all their suppliers and they had to, also, and they had to let half their staff go like most companies around the world. And um, they had to stop production of my bass pickups. So it took me three years to work with, to, to try different pickup makers um, um, who are you know, a, a very different breed of, of humans, I've got to say. <laughs> but I finally was recommended a company I, I, I knew about but hadn't even thought about was Nordstrand. And they're in California. Mm -hmm. I dropped in and met Carrie Nordstrand and had a chat. And he's a bass player. He's a, you know, we're both, he's a fan and, he got it and then he just he just built it as per my patent and actually made it even better you know like to, to my mind makes it a bit more a little bit more um tonal than it used to be you know it just sounds a little bit more live yeah right uh, 
And that only happened, he only delivered those four months ago, three months ago. And I've got a company in that I, I met with a year ago now in Carlsbad, a company called Iconic Guitars. And they hand make guitars and, and they make a few bases of their own, but they don't really make them anymore. So that now you know, they they are now my 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 bass makers. Um they completely pulled apart all my my prototypes and computer rendered them and the whole thing and and start off with you know computer necks and, com and computer cut bodies and then hand shape everything else from then on and hand spray them and and put the pickups in so it's all local i live i live in in orange county down south of la and, and they're just a bit further down south another 20 minutes down south so um yeah so it's been a long journey but um they're now you know being being built as per my specs and i'm i'm pretty um anal about how i want them to sound and how i want them to feel and mm. i think we've got it by george we have it you know <laughs> in terms of the pickups positioning is it in the p base position it's exactly in the p base position yeah yep okay i just copied everything as far as balance not yeah you know, even the there is a P base model. You've got the XS2, which is the Jazz Master custom shape. This is the XS1, which is a custom jazz body. They're both shaved down because you know, there's no need to have big heavy bodies. Um mm -hmm. and the P base, um the first one I built, number one, is a P base. And it did Lake Placid Blue with a, a you know the gold aluminum guard. Mm -hmm. uh, I just got a bit carried away with the different shapes in the first two two models, uh, but XS3 is a P base. Okay. And this is an XS3 fretless. Yeah. So um the P base, you know, is my go-to base, but that, that is the XS3 model. Um, is that and I'm also building that, a would that be hmm? Daphne Blue? That's that's a surf green, but I've okay. built one in Lake Placid Blue with Gold Guard. I've never actually owned a Lake Placid Blue Gold Guard base. Um but I've always wanted to. So I built that's yep. a, the number one base I built myself was a was Lake Placid Blue. And I found someone in Los Angeles that does the aluminum guards, the original anodized aluminum guard, mm. um, which is kind of a forgotten art. So he's he's built so you can actually order the bases with an aluminum aluminum guard. And if you order the replica of Old Faithful, my 58 in excess base, it comes standard with a with a you know, exact replica of the anodized guard that's on Old Faithful right now. Yeah, right. Um, so neck like profile is that fifty eight P base? Yeah, yep. Yeah. Maybe <clears throat> just slightly different. Just you know, slightly thinner, just a little bit. I mean, yeah. But everything, yeah, you know, balance. Everything is based off, except for the extra fret, of course. Is yeah, based yeah. On, based on the Old Faithful. But I, you know, I work with Old Faithful. I had. The neck completely micrometered and and computer driven, and I just thought we'll just go for a slightly, just slightly rounder, slightly thinner. Yeah, just a bit. A bit I more mean, I I think I even noticed between this green one and and the white one behind me there, the the necks are just ever so slightly different as well. Because I guess ultimately they're still hand they're hand carved, right? Hand yeah. finished. Yep. Yep. Yeah, they're all hand hand. Yeah, once they cut, they're all hand shaped. So yeah, there'll be slight variations, but um. Yeah, you know, and also I think, yeah, just to, they feel differently in your hands anyway. Because I mean, um, this has become my favorite configuration: the the the, you know, the the jazz shaped body with the white and the what I call Pacific blue. Yeah, um, yeah, that's that's this week's favorite because I you know with a with a rosewood neck. Um, yeah. I've never really had a jazz bass, so you know it's it's interesting to me to to play it, and it's uh, I'm loving it. <laughs> Um, and wood combinations or wood options, what do we have in the, the body? It's pretty light. Yeah, they are light. They're, they're select older. They're all, everything's older as per the old 58. Um, and they're, it's select older, you know, hand, hand selected older wood. And it's, it's, it's dried a little bit. Um, yeah, it's, it's baked a little bit to dry it out. And also, um, when we paint them, we freeze them to like get the paint, so it's easy to relic the paint to oh, like to uh, the checking and stuff. Yeah, the checking. So they're frozen for a couple of weeks too. So <laughs> after they're painted, 
Um, so they go through a bit of a process um, to to hand make them, and I just just got the just the other day I got a, an old guy that does the laser etching. For the, oh yeah, for the, that's cool. Yeah, just picked them up like three days ago and put them on. Yeah, mine. Um, this one doesn't have that. Yeah, you haven't got that yet. I got I've, I've, yours is sitting in my in my workshop. <laughs> I've got I, that's that's number so, I think that's number six. Um, and then like hardware, machine heads, and and bridges, just pretty standard Fender. What do we have on the end? They are just they're lighter and they're lighter and smaller than standard. Um, I get these because I I don't I, I don't want any neck dive or neck heavy. So these. And also, I can get you know these are I've got them nicely aged in the yeah. Know. But everyone's like, why don't you get a, a like a, a a neck through and and get a badass and all that? So it's like no. that's not what Leo had you know. I just like what Leo had. Whatever Leo did, it works you know. And you know, I will still play an old fifty eight to a new Spectre or anything. I mean, whatever's out there these days, I'll still gravitate towards a, a vintage, you know, whatever Leo did or whatever you know. Have you have you garnered a newfound respect for 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 Leo Fender after having gone through this process of trying to build and design your own bases? Like, <clears throat> I had a respect when as soon as I picked up Old Faithful, and and I, I used to you know I had a big collection of of old basses and guitars, Fenders especially in Australia, um, but even more so, um, I was with G and L. And they're in and then they're in Fullerton, California, mm -hmm. on Fender Avenue, um, and that was Leo's last company. That's that's where he was the day he died. He was actually you know fell down at work and then went to hospital and died. So his office, when I was still working with him, his office is still there, right next to the front office, with all his Polaroids piled up high of his mm -hmm. his life. I don't know why they weren't chronicling it, and because it's, it's his workshop. He even had his his little foam styrofoam. Uh, coffee mug with Leo written on it because he's a he's a cheap guy and he had the same styrofoam mug for years. Um, but yeah, I had a, I had a huge respect for him because he you know, right to the day he died, he was still doing what he loved, which is building guitars. And you know, he built the you know the P bass, the jazz bass. That I've I've got um, a, a seventy five Stingray, which is a first year Stingray, which Leo probably had his hands all over personally because it's the first year, so it's kind of like a prototype. And it, it feels like an old fan. It doesn't feel like a music man at all. And it's mm. really light. And it's it's even though it's active, it doesn't, I don't think I've ever changed the battery. I don't even know if the battery works, but it just sounds great. Um that's why I wanted to get a bit of a music man sound out of this pickup too. Um and so yeah, so and what Leo was doing with G and L was pretty good too. I mean, it was you know, the, the LB one hundred did when they first bought them out were a great P base, you know, mm. a smaller I didn't realize at the time how much smaller the body was than a normal P bass. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, oh yeah. So long story short, yeah, Leo's a, Leo's a bit of a, a hero of mine. It's crazy how how right he got it back then. For a non-musician, <clears throat> you know? yeah, and, and to basically to you know his amplifiers. I know he, he was a tech, he was a an amp repair guy, mm. so it was more odds, you know, more chance he was going to build a good amplifier, but. To build basses, you know, and to get it right from the beginning, and guitars. Yeah. I mean, the strats still, and the the tellies are still, you know, the go to guitars in the world. Well, that's you know? it. And because oftentimes I think musical instruments or musical equipment that are that's been built purely from an engineering perspective, they don't always hit the mark, you know, because yeah. it's, you're making a musical instrument, but somehow, you know, Leo managed to merge both those worlds together yeah and he you know he 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 was probably just flaky enough to 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 get by and not to, and not be too business orientated you know like he I, I i from what i hear of the initial um days of fender was very much a family kind of thing you know like and um you know it, 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 you know, it was a very good atmosphere to be be involved with you know mm -hmm. and and he you know the quality control wasn't like insane like in a lot of companies is because I, I know that especially with guitars with strats that so, so you know some of them sound completely different because whoever was winding the pickup someone they might they might forget what they were doing and overwind it or they might be going to lunch and they underwind it so you yeah. might get completely different sounds that are completely you know the same instrument made in the same day so mm -hmm. um 
that's that's just you know one of the bits of history that I like about about Fender. Did you ever consider using the the Stingery as as a main axe? No, because it, it's to me it's not a rock it's not a rock bass. It's, it's not you know, a rock I, bass. I, I, wow. I like I like the grunge of a P bass, um, and you know through a big loud Ampeg rig, you can't really beat a P bass. You know, um, I used them in the studio a bit, and I used them. I had an old fretless that I used on the one thing, and and I used um, a lot on Shabu Shabar actually um, in my fretless moments, but. And I didn't have a P bass at that time. That's when I, that was that tour that I went out and I, I found some P basses to buy. Um, I hadn't quite found the right P bass at that time, but when I found a good L series and then later um, my fifty eight in eighty five, that was that was it. I was I was hooked on the P bass being the, the you, main. Sound for can me. you remember or can you divulge what you paid for a fifty eight P bass in nineteen eighty five? Fourteen hundred bucks, and that was seemed to be a lot. You know, like. And that was the guy came to soundcheck in Chicago at a theatre we we're playing at, and he had like, they asked you know bring in your fifty eights, and he and he bought in like five, and it went from like five hundred bucks for the really beaten up to you know two and a half for pristine, so we went right in the middle and got old faithful for forty nine. <laughs> That's great. And do you reckon like you know mid eighties old P bases weren't really desirable like they are now no they weren't no i i used to um like we get our per diems our, you know our, our, our you know, eating money um mm. and i'd save it up i'd i'd eat at friends houses or eat with a crew I'd, or i wouldn't eat and just save my money up until i had enough at the end and we usually end up the tour in la or new york and i go to the stores and buy myself a base <laughs> That's you know, what, I, bought, I mean, I don't bought, know if that's genius or if that means you've got a bit of a problem. I'm not. I can't. Uh, yeah, I had a problem. No, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a collector. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't have it all now, of course. You know, um, time and 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 circumstances have re- removed them from my life. But uh, Are there I any ones, them. any ones I, that you, any ones that you wish you hadn't let go? Oh, all of them. I mean, I had oh. I had one of the best guitar collections and bass collections in Australia, in the oh. world. You know, I won't go into that, but you know. I, I've still got the insurance for you know, readout of of what I had, and I'm like, why don't I throw this away? Because this makes me feel bad what oh, I had, you know. Shit. But yeah, it, it's fine. I, I, it's they've all gone to happy homes, I hope, and I'm sure they're all being used. I, mean, mm. I, I just sat like in, in my cupboard, which is silly. You know, guitars deserve well, to be played. What well, What was the biggest challenge in piecing together the XS bases? Like what was the thing, the biggest hurdle? Um, it took two years to get the patent because I had to keep the, the patent office of America kept coming back to me with, well, well, what's different to this patent? And I'd have to do a, you know, multi-page explanation. Was that, was, it, was that? Do you reckon in the end that was a good thing because it really made you, hundred percent certain on on what it was that you were doing, or was it just more of a pain in the ass? <laughs> Well, yeah, and also again, like I did woodwork and electronics, but I also did. Um, I was going to be a draftsman. I did. I was really good at at, at, at drawing. Okay. Um, and I applied to the Garden Island Naval Dockyard when when I left school and it was accepted. But then I by then I'm like mm, music, and took off to Perth with the guys. So, um, so I did all my own drawings for the pattern. So it, it, you know, I didn't have to employ someone to. You know, I had a patent attorney, but I didn't have to get, employ someone to redo all the drawings. I just sit there and redo them myself. So I, I was meant to do that. You know, I was meant to get that patent. So, um, but it was, yeah, I, it was interesting to see what a patent office would would consider conflicting in in what I was putting together and what they thought mm. I was putting together. Um, so I'd have to, you know, explain it like I was explaining it to a child sometimes to the patent office. But in the end, it, it made me realize that, I, you know, it was worth persevering because I, you know, you, I don't know what a patent's worth these days as far as protection. Um, but it felt good to get it, you know, and it felt feels good to say that, you know, because really, what are the odds? It uh, pick up a magnet with with copper wire. I mean, it's been around for hundreds of years, you know. Like, mm. but I just persevered and I got I got my patent for something that um, that really works. That, that really does sound great, you know. Yeah. Um, I, one thing I think that 
a lot of people, and certainly I didn't realize until, or didn't really consciously think about until recently, is that a traditional pea-based pickup is a humbucker, or is humbucking. Yeah. Is that yeah. is that correct? Yep, that is true. you think of it as like single coil, but it's a split single coil, right? That's what changes it, differentiates it from the yeah. from the fifty two P base or whatever. Yep, you get rid. Of, yeah, to be a hum a hum cancelling pickup. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, and why Leo's? I think because he obviously wanted to get the bigger magnets next to each other. He, he split them and you know so he could overlap them. So it was just necessity. Yeah. Do you want to take a quick break? <clears throat> yeah, go for it. Yeah. All right, we're back with Yin and Yang. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, one thing I, I noticed about playing these bases is I feel like they really respond super well to playing with a pick. Like they have this full range, crisp attack, but like a rich, tight bottom end. You know, sometimes yeah. when you start playing with a pick, the bottom end can kind of bottom out, for, for a better phrase, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. But with this, it just, it's really... It's really round. It's, I mean, it's, it's really a really round, round yeah. bottom Because um, a pick, you know, I'm predominantly a, pick, a finger player, but pick is my go-to thing for, for getting really aggressive and, like, don't change. and Yeah. So it's got to have, you know that pick sound and all, like, and also be, you know, good enough to play just an open A you know, with a pick and still be, and still be huge. You know, like that's, that's a, that's a big thing for a lot of bases is it, is it open strings to send thin, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. And, and in, in, I really enjoyed like when I, on my website, on the, the base website, um, I, I really enjoyed putting all the, the sound bites together, all the sound recordings. Cause I, I, I I did ones with you know with the single calls with a pick and the full humbucker with a pick and I just um, um because I'd already done the record the Ashton Moon record I played and I've done sessions with using my bases it's all all I've used since I built them is my bases is are these bases and and I've I've enjoyed discovering um, how versatile the pickups are myself mm -hmm. you know even I I, you know, I invented them so. Um, that's been the fun part. And also you know, having all my prototypes, I put round wounds date on, on, you know, really bright round wounds. I put completely dead flat wounds on some to get that, you know, even, and, and again with a pick, just a complete dead Carol K kind of sound, you know, like, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> it's fun to experiment with them, but yeah, they, they are great with a pick you know, in all different configurations of sounds. Yeah. Well, I think as soon as I've got it here, I may as, we may, may as well just go through, what what it does what they sound like so control is we've got volume and then we've got like pickup type selector i guess it's oh. balance yeah balance and then an overall tone control yep that is push pull right yeah, push 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 correct yeah <laughs> um, i originally had push pull but i would find that it, you know, in the in the heat of it, it, it's easy just to go push push. You know, like so I yeah, changed. Yeah, yeah, no, that's true. Yeah, it is. It is push push. Nice little mechanism. So and sometimes with... you'd be so you'd be so crazy. You pull up. You stand there with a knob in your hands. So I changed that. <laughs> you don't want to be standing there with a knob in your hand on stage. Oh, exactly. Yep. Um, so with with tone pushed down, pushed in, and then the balance all the way towards the neck. That's traditional p bass pickup yeah. right everything forward is a p bass yeah and then if we roll that pickup selector all the way towards the bridge that's reverse p pickup yeah so yep. the um the treble pull pieces are now closer to the neck and the bass pole pieces are now closer to the bridge. Yeah, which as I said before, I always thought would be more common sense for a, a P bass to have a thicker, you know, D and G string and a yes yeah. the E and A string, but that's not how Leo did it. Yeah. And, it, yeah. and it's it's relatively subtle, but it it does really tighten up that that bottom that bottom end on the on the E and the A, especially 
Mm-hmm. Like if you do that and then go to front. <laughs> It's a bit more. I, I keep saying hollow. It's. I mean, it's just a bit more scooped, maybe. Yeah, um, a little bit. But then you, then you do the, the, the fighter D and G strings. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I also find that when you're playing one bass with your effects too. I mean, you get, you can get completely different or you know, noticeably different sounds out of your, your the same effects pedal using different different pickup. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the way, I, the way it interacts with the pedal, the frequencies and stuff that are getting in there. Yeah. If you're using like a single coil you know, neck through a vintage fuzz, it's going to sound more authentic and vintage with a, with a single coil as opposed to a, a, you know, a full, a split humbucker or even a full humbucker. I mean, sure. um, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just finding a, you know, I'm trying to do videos for my website and what, and YouTube and stuff showing that because the having a versatile pickup is not just about the sounds it's about how you, you can use them too mm. and then we put the pan in the middle and we've got what, hum, humbucker yeah full humbucker all four coils at once all four coils at once right okay <laughs> And it's got it's got like a little bit of that music man kind of yeah. honk. Being uh, obviously music man's is back here. Yeah, more more near the bridge. So you get the it's 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 kind of you know thinner, but I I like the fact that it's it's music managed, but it, it's fatter with yeah. it like a, more of a round P bass bottom end. You know, like it's yeah yeah. Um, I have found no need. I, I did build a five string where the it's back here. The pickups back here. But every you know, you can get that sound out of any bass. You know, like um, it's interesting that you get a, a you can get a P bass sound back here, but it's still not quite a P bass sound because it's back here. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> but you know, I, I I just found that just you know sticking the pickup exactly where a P bass is, and then getting the variations from from these from the tone from the controls is is to me still the ideal way to use the bass. Would it be possible to do a, a two pickup version so that you could? I did a two pickup version. Um, if, <clears throat> but if you really want the the jazz bass, and and then and um, you could even put a, a thinner, you know, like a thinner single coil there, matching single coil. But I mean, if you want that jazz bass sound, um, get a jazz bass. Yeah, you know, it's it's something to look at. But I mean, I I don't know. Then you got to get more complicated with the controls you know yeah, what i mean like it'd be pretty complicated controls did the you, one i built i just had a switch then you just have you know yeah i was going to say did you consider at, at what point does because the <clears throat> the pan is sent got a center detent at what point yeah. did the does the pickup pan happen like is it all the way when you get all the way to the end or is it as soon as it clicks past that midway it's, point it's continuous it's it's, it's continuous? Like you know, variations is panning through i mean right. at some point I, I I might even offer if someone gets you know, really gets or a stickler about their sound is, is put like a, a maybe a, a five way switch you know like or a six way yeah. switch center detent and then then they can get exactly the same variations yeah. of how they want the pickups but at the moment I've got the just a, a, a you know just a, a, a balance knob um, yeah. and if to be honest I I just think if if you got a I've got a lot of sounds that I want pick up if you want to get that bridge pickup maybe you you're in the wrong base i mean if you want to get that that um that you know the jaco sound then play the jaco sound because i think once you start getting another pickup you're going to get so many different variations and i did i did build it to pick up one mm-hmm. um and but the variations became a little bit too too much i mean you know especially if you, when you start using the balance you probably have to if you had two pickups you probably have to put in a, a like a a, a selector a yeah. switch select you know like in, instead of a uh you know like a just a balance yeah flying balance control and then, then you have variations. we push down push down the the tone control and now um all the way to the neck we've got this f- these front two coils yeah yeah which is quite you know relatively it's a relatively dark sound And then all the way to the bridge, we've got just that that back. 
coil on mm-hmm. the pickup. Chuck, I quite like that. Yeah, it, it's, my, it's one of my favorites. And, and the reverse um, split humbucker too, because again, just with a, I hate to say hollow or scooped, but it, it just sounds a bit more, just a bit more musical in a way. Um, and yeah. it, it also, it's more open. I, I play quite aggressively. Yeah. I really play hard. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I just tend to find that those two that, that those settings and the single core settings get more of a, more of a spank out of the, out of the, out of the, the pickup and out of the neck, you know? Yeah. Um, I, f- I found that when I use this, I use this one on on my gig, and I found that I was I was actually quite I wasn't sure how I was going to if I was just going to set it in traditional P bass setting and just leave it there. But I found that for certain songs, I was switching to the reverse P to kind of tighten things up or you know go more of that front pickup or the traditional P mm-hmm. pickup if I wanted to kind of like a slightly fuller sound. And it's not like you're changing. It's not like you're pressing a a, a, a pedal and getting a completely different EQ. It still sounds like the same bass, but just the frequencies that are being emphasized shift a little bit. Yeah. Um, it's just funny because I, I look at it very simple. It's like the P bass <clears throat> to me has always been the rock bass uh, or the funk bass. And then to get the variation with the reverse to me just makes it a bit more useful as far as using effects or using yeah it's a bit more pronounced with a pick with a reverse mm-hmm. pick yeah the humbucker I always find a bit more of a, of a jazzy fusiony kind of sound even though a lot of a lot of players um younger players get use that sound for the for the heavy metal stuff you know um yeah um and then I just find the single coils to be um to me just a, a great finger you know finger sound overall because yeah. it just seems to be as i said more, a bit more musical a bit more it just makes you feel a bit more adventurous in some ways but are the, uh, when, when we're in like single coil mode are, do those hum cancel no you get you get some noise okay but... um i had a, i had a, one of uh, yeah as i said i tried different pickup makers and one guy was all about let's make them hum hum cancelling and i'm like well but then you're just varying you know, it was if it's good enough for leo you know in the whole thing yeah. Um, and then he just he just started trying to change the the, the actual the mojo of the pickup, you know. Mm-hmm. And and the mojo of the pickup is yeah, it, you get a bit of a bit of buzz, you know. That's my you know, as opposed to. But it's it's minimal, you know. We're yeah, it is. And, and, and if you're in the studio, just move around. It goes away, you know. Like turn the if, lights if, off, <laughs> face <yeah>. the corner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and live, you, if, if you, you're probably going to be loud enough that it's not going to bother you anyway. <laughs> you know, yeah, you're going to yeah. out the volume <clears throat> to me, and it's it, it is minimal. And to be able to get that sound, but if you, you know, if you want to get into hum cancelling and that sort of stuff, you know, if it's a problem, then we can talk about it as far as you know, redesigning the pickup. But I just don't think it's a problem at the moment. I just think it's okay. everything works really well. And I know one pickup maker was just he was trying to think of ways to in his mind improve it and all he did was make it not work <laughs> he Next. tried to try to you know push the, the coils the, the 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 pole pieces out wider to get a wider p bass sound but then it's like but then That's the a sound. bottom <laughs> strings sound different to the top strings in single coil like just stick you know what's that <laughs> from um Three amigos, you 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 stray from the formula, you pay the price. You know, like it's it's just leave it the way it is. If it, if it ain't broke, sort of thing. And yeah, you know, and, you know, it's my patent, but it's based on Leo. It's based on whatever Leo did that worked. You know, like I got no problems with anything Leo did. And who's this base for, in your mind? I don't know. I mean, I built the prototypes, obviously for me. Um, you know. I wanted a fretless. I wanted a five string. I wanted a, you know, yeah, this color, that color. One I just would always sit around with completely dead, dead flat wounds on it. Will Will these be available in five string? Yeah, okay. um, five strings. I should go. Uh, yeah, the five. There's a five strings. <laughs> they're, they're in my other garage. This is, I mean, actually, my studio is my garage. My garage. I mean, my other garage. There's, I think, eighteen bases in their cases sitting there. But the, there's there's five strings. You'll see on the website now. I put it. I, um. I've been redoing the website since I got the bases. I picked up the final ones last week. So okay. I've been redoing all the photographs um, and finally had 
completed five strings. That was the, the, the final um, part of the first the first batch I had built with the two five strings. Um, and they are now on the website. Um, there's a there's a, 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 a there's a Lake Placid blue and a one of these tangerine colors, that mm -hmm. tangerine, candy apple yeah. tangerine. Um, and the five strings are amazing because um, you can get that that the music manny sound, but you can also get a P bass that works on a five string because every five string I've ever had, I think except for maybe a, a three hundred dollar. Uh, music man copy i think it was a, a sub five that was was called out of korea yep that's the only bass that i got where the b string sounded like it was part of the bass where it wasn't like a four string bass with a with a piano string on the bottom yeah um, and my pickup has that ability it makes the it makes the bass sound like it's all the same bass so the b string sounds you know you can get a p bass sound and a reverse p bass sound and um out of out of a five string um i haven't seen a bass that does it yet and and i know that have um, you sorry for the five string have you redesigned the neck shape a little bit yeah it was like, it's it's be it's wider, slightly so. wider but not too wide because i i really can't you know yeah. play too wide and it still the same it kind is of like wider. Yeah. But it's the same. And thickness or it's it's all written on the on the website i, I okay. you know I, I i found the right five string neck um dimensions uh, over the years of, of me, you know playing fives I, I i'm not really a five player mm -hmm. but i've had them you know because i've had to use them in various projects and i did collect them for a while um and i always rotated you know it, it was there was ones that worked and then they didn't work and there's ones that i built that were great and um and i, I did build one that i did like the night the neck dimensions and i kind of stuck to that and so, um, but it's, it tends, it's the neck is obviously, you know, wider, but, mm -hmm. but I try to keep it. So it's not like a club and not like, like, like some crazy yeah you know, that piece of wood. It's, it's still got to feel musical okay. and comfortable. <clears throat> um, and are people able to kind of specifically order their custom, like a custom build or is it? There's an order page on the website. You can, you right. can order, right. yeah. As long as you stick, you can you basically stick to the parameters of the colors, the shapes, um, four string, five string, left, right, maple, rosewood. Um, is it? Yeah, or what is the? Still, are you using rosewood or what? What are you using on the? For the fingerboard on, on yours one, sorry. Rosewood. It is rosewood. Okay. Yeah, and the one yeah you've got the maple, but um, I I started out. Obviously, my 58 is rosewood, but all my L series P bases, uh, sorry, my 58 is maple, but all my old L series P bases are all rosewood. So, you know, I, I kind of started out with rosewood, but then became a maple fan when I got old faithful. But um, I'm really hearing the difference in these bases. The pickups really do sound different with, with maple versus rosewood. I mean, the rosewood sounds warmer, the maple sound a bit more rock and roll, a bit more aggressive. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm, you know, this particular configuration right now with the rosewood and the jazz shape, I'm just really loving. I mean, it's just, just not one that I'm, I'm used to, um, but it's one I'm gravitating towards right now. But um, I also, when I was in Australia and I left that one with Adam, the, the one you're holding, mm. I was, really, I, I took that to Australia because I just love the maple. Um, so I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of both, and, and I know that they're, they're very useful, and yeah, you know, and give you a different option for whatever sound you want. It's not just looks. I mean, they, you know, I have an explanation on the website as to the tonal variations of rosewood versus maple. Yep. Yeah. And so what's, what's next for GGB bases? Um, it turns out that building the things and designing them over the years was the easy part. I mean, the hard part is now is marketing and all that sort of stuff. So, um, I, I, I'm working with, I've got a, a marketing person and I, and I had a social media company working with me that um, I ended up letting go on the way to the airport when I was flying to Australia recently um, because their interpretation of, of what they were doing and what the money I was paying them was completely different to what I was, see, what I was seeing. Mm -hmm. um, so I, uh, hence I've been redoing all the website myself and redoing all the photographs because 
you know, they had the photographs that they put in there were just not doing justice to how beautiful these things are, you know? Mm, um, yeah. So I'm redoing all the photographs. I'm meeting with a new social media person, I think today, later so, this afternoon. Um, so the net, yeah, it's, it's now is, is the marketing. I've, I've spoken to distributors, but um, especially in Australia, uh, you know, Australian dollar is so bad that it's, it's, it's hard to, for a distributor to find a margin. So yeah, at the moment, at this point in time, it's all order order online, um, and uh, and but it's a, it's a, it's a process going forward. I want to I want to eventually absolutely find an Australian distributor where people can play the bases and and have the bases ready you know ready to go. It's just I have twenty four bases available now. Three are in Australia, um, two are in New York, and. Um, I think 15 are in my garage and two are with, with players that I respect for their, um, uh, yeah, Freddie Washington has one at the moment. That's He's cool. God's gift to bass playing. Mm-hmm. Um, because I need, I need that feedback from other players besides myself, you know, and, mm-hmm. and you know, guys like Freddie who, you know, I, you know, he's still got his original 74 P mm-hmm. bass that he played forget me nots on and sitting in his, his studio so I went up and met him um, a couple of weeks ago, and he loves. He, he took exactly one of these with the rosewood, right? Um, and you know, we compared it with his his seventy four P bass, and it, it compared really well. Mm-hmm. And that's the sort of feedback I need. You know, is from people that I respect and the people who've been there, done it. You know, and mm-hmm. you ask the question, who are these for? They're for everybody. I mean, I know being hand built boutique bases built in America, they're they're probably pretty pricey. If you look at it for an Australian, especially because um, I'm starting them at four nine nine five as US, mm-hmm. uh, but that's what they are because they're hand hand built and yeah, you know, and the the only place you can get this pickup and this configuration is in this base. Yeah. Uh, down the track, I might look at cost cutting different manufacturing, but at this point in time, I'm loving the fact that they are really top quality instruments, hand built here in California. Mm. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm probably reducing the amount of of customers, um, yeah, that I, that I'm you know looking at. But I mean, down the track, I know that when bass players get these things in their hands, they're gonna they're gonna think twice about about what they want from a bass and what they and, and you know get a whole new perspective on what they can get from one bass. Yeah, would you ever consider selling the? pickup and wiring stuff separately for retrofits and stuff probably down the track and i'm sure um carrie nordstrand you know he's going to want to chat about it down the track but right now um i'm really happy with them being in the bases mm-hmm. and i think either way the bases have to get out there and, and get known mm-hmm. um that's because if, if people just stick the pickup in in their own base it's not going to have the same it's not going to work the same I mean, okay. yeah, the bases and the pickup are you know, designed to go together right now. Okay. So I, I just couldn't imagine just someone sticking this pickup in a base and going, ah, oh. yeah. <laughs> it, it just must be one of those things that end up in the, the pickup Do, pile. Does each base come through your hands at the at the end for final checks and stuff? Oh, totally. Yeah. I just, as I said, I just showed you the the. The uh, yep. the neck plates uh, I I put all those on myself the other day. I took all the bases apart and put them all back on again. I play them all. They're all they're all serial numbered. Um, I've been doing videos of individual ones. So you know, whoever gets one of these bases, you know, it gets a personal. Yeah, you know, I set them up. Yeah, you know, they're brand new bases. So yeah, you know, they all come set up beautifully from from iconic guitars. But then yeah. You know, I still go over them and change whatever I need to change. Some some of them the pickups are too low. Some pick, pickups, yeah. yeah. I want the pickups at the same height. I want all the bases to be exactly how I, I would go out and play play them tonight at a gig. Mm. Do you have a, a strings that you prefer to stick on them or? You know, I I I've got sponsorships with strings, and um, yeah, I used to obviously just use rotor sounds, like I think forties to hundreds, I think. Mm-hmm. Probably forty fives to hundreds, but um, uh, I think Ernie Ball's been the, the string the, the string company has been looking after me for a while. So Ernie Ball's a pretty good company too. But um, they come with you know they come standard with some beautiful beautiful round round strings. Um, 
so yeah, I mean, it's yeah, <laughs> I'll work with you know, the, the string makers as well, you know, down the track, but at the moment, it's only balls. Cool. Well, man, it's been awesome chatting with you and hearing all these stories and getting to play these basses. Big shout out to Adam and Pika for making this connection happen and, and you know, letting yeah. me spend some time with these with these basses. Adam's a lovely guy, He's a big fan, of course. <laughs> He's a great guy, great guy. Yeah. Um, it's just ironic he was in an excess cover band playing, being me. And it's, <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Yeah, this must be, is that, is that a little bit surreal for you seeing oh, yeah. <laughs> tribute bands and stuff? It is. It's surreal, and and yeah, it's sometimes annoying because you know I I I I do miss playing, and I I I like to be out there playing, but yeah, you know, at this point in time, I'm not. So sometimes it's 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 um it's fun to see, but it sometimes it drives me a bit crazy. It's them, not me, you know, at playing it. Yeah. Well. <laughs> well, hopefully these do get into a lot more um, bass players' hands. They are. They're awesome, awesome instruments you've done, obviously, um, a lot of hard work in, in putting these together. So um, I wish you all the success in, in the future, man. Thanks, mate. Thank you. Yeah. I, but yeah, yeah. I, here's hoping. I, I'm I'm very, very happy with how they turned out. And it's been years in the in the process. And I'm, I, you know, the next step is, as you say, just getting them in the right hands, getting them into, yeah, awesome. into, into, into bass lovers' hands. Yeah, great. Thanks, man. Thank you, mate. All the best.